Hey, I'm John. Thanks for joining me for this video today. In this video, I'm going to be starting on Bandai's HGUC Messer Type F01. And let me tell you, this is a big kit. I got to pull the camera way back to get that box in there. It's really big for an HG kit. In lore, most mobile suits are 18 meters tall. This one in the Gundam world is 23 meters tall. So this thing is almost the size of a master grade kit. If you've seen or built the, the real grade Sazabi, it's, it's that big. So I'm really looking forward to, to building and painting and weathering this guy. There's about 10 sprues in the kit. Um, there's actually not a lot of parts for a kit this big. It's just that the parts are, are very big. I mean, if, if you've built Gunpla, I mean, that leg piece there, these leg pieces, that's, that's about the size of, of a master grade GM. And, you know, this is really big. There's one sticker sheet, not very many stickers on this thing, but this is definitely a monster of an HG. Now, just to give a little more of a size comparison, this is an HG GM Custom. And this is the bottom of the Messer's foot. And you can see this, this thing is, is almost twice as big as the GM's foot. So it's, it's really going to stand tall. As far as instructions goes, it's fairly standard stuff. Um, you get your step-by-step -step of, of building all the different parts, uh, the arms, the legs, the torso. Uh, and, and as you see here, there's, there's not a lot of steps to the construction in terms of that there's not a lot of parts. It's, it's big, but it's not a party kit. One thing I did notice is some of these sprues, especially this, this one right here, the, the part of the B2 sprue, um, there's a lot of X's on there, meaning those parts aren't being used. Here's some X's here. Um, so I'm guessing that there's going to be some other version coming that will have uh, these parts in it. So that'll be interesting to see. And then finally, here's the, the photos of the, the completed model. And you'll notice that it's, it's, uh, it's up on this stand here. It looks like it can be posed fairly dynamically. Interestingly, there's no poly caps in this. Uh, it's it's uh, all plastic. So if you want to build something with a fixed pose, this would be a great candidate for it because you can glue everything um, in place. Uh, it's got this cool looking gun. The story behind this is that it's a Xeon looking suit, but it's actually used by a Federation force, as I understand it. I don't think the anime that this is in has actually come out as of the time that I'm filming this. Um, got the color guide down here, which gives you the color mixes both in Japanese and English. I'm not sure that I'm going to stick with this tan color. I like the rest of the color. I like the variation in the colors, but I'm not sure that I like this tan color. I may uh, moderate that a little bit, desaturate it, or bring it a little closer to uh, a very warm white. We'll see. That's down the road. All right, with all that out of the way, it's time to take this to my office and do my lunchtime gunpla thing and get this guy built up. Okay, I have everything assembled, uh, loose assembled. I made sure to clip the pegs a little bit as I was putting it together so that I could get it back apart for painting and, and uh, the, the reassembly. But overall, this is a really, really good kit. The only two... Uh, really seam lines that I'm going to have to deal with are on the mobile suit itself or on the head right here. And I'm just going to scribe that in and treat that as a panel line right along there. Um, it'd be easy enough to glue it and sand it, but I'm, I'm going to just treat it as a panel line. And then there's also a panel line right there on the back of the arm. 
And again, I'm just going to scribe in a line with my Tamiya scriber, call it a panel line, and be done with it. The rest of it, there's there's no panel lines to or seam lines to worry about. Every everything on it is either treated as a panel line where two parts come together, or it's covered up by something else. So they did a really good job in the engineering and in the, in the planning and the engineering of this. There aren't any poly caps on it, which I like because it gives me the option if I choose to of gluing it in a fixed position. I'm probably not going to do that on this one, but I like that option. I will say that on the waist armor pieces, the skirt armor, because there are no poly caps and it's, it's plastic uh, uh, connections, there, there is a tendency for some of these parts to fall off if you move them around a lot. I mean, like this one right here, it just pops off at the drop of the hat. So that, that is one thing to consider. If you're somebody who likes posing them a lot, you're, you're probably going to get a little frustrated with some of the skirt armor. But since I'm one who paints it and builds it, sell it and never look at it again, um, I'm not going to worry about it too much. But overall, this is a great build experience. If you've been on the fence about whether to get this thing, wondering how it goes together, th this is one of the best Gunpla kits I've ever built. I wish every one of them were this way. Now, as is typical with most HG kits, there is a seam line around the gun. You can see I've already been working on that, put some Mr. Servicer on it, and it goes all the way around that. I mean, it's not even, it's not even close. Um, so I wish Bandai would do a little better job with the, the weapons, but it is what it is. So I just sanded it down, put some Mr. Surfacer on it. I'll give that a couple of days to dry and then I'll sand it on uh, further and get it nice and smooth and it'll be good to go. All right, as I'd mentioned, there's a bit of a seam line right there along the back of the arm. And a simple way to take care of that is just squeeze it together and then take your scriber, I'm using a Tamiya scriber, and just gently pull it in through that line. And just a few passes of this will deepen that down enough that it's going to quite, it's going to qu pass quite well for a panel line that's supposed to be there rather than a seam line where the kit doesn't come together quite so well. Now, when I pull it apart, I'll smooth that down just a little bit, but I'll be able to run some wash through that and it'll look like it's supposed to be there. I just got to do the same thing on the other arm and that seam around the head. The kit colors are this kind of tan for the most of the, the armor sections. And then the other parts are a, I'm not sure what you would kind of call this, a reddish, brownish kind of color. It's a cool color. Um, I like it. And then there's this darker brown on the legs and there's some on the elbow. There's not a whole lot of this dark brown on it. And then a few yellow vents and things like that. What I decided to do was, I, I wouldn't dare call this a custom color scheme. I would just call this a color shift. But what I've done is I used, one of my favorite colors is to me a whole red XF9. So I used whole red as the basis. This is really kind of whole red right here as the basis for uh, the color scheme. So what I've done is the parts that are this kind of reddish brown here, I did those in whole red, so they're a little darker. Then for this darker part, I took whole red and mixed in some XF69 NATO black and made a very dark reddish black. You, you, you have to look at it in the light just right to kind of, to kind of get the red coming through. Um, at a distance or in poor lighting, it'll just look like black. But I'm okay with that. That's what I intended. Then for the armor part, I went lighter. And I started with a base of XF2 uh, white from Tamiya. And then I added in just a touch of the whole red and to, to give it just a bit of warmth. That made it a little bit more pink than I wanted. And uh, so what I did was I added just a touch of Dectan XF55 to tone that down a bit. 
Now, as I'm looking at it through the camera, it looks much more gray than uh, what I'm seeing here in my hand because I, I see I see this, and then when I look through the camera here, it looks a little different. So if it looks more gray than than with just a slight reddish pinkish tint to it, um, the what what the camera's picking up and what I'm seeing in real life is a little different. So you just have to trust me if it's not if it's not showing as slightly. If you've seen the the desert vehicles that the British used in World War II, there was a pink color that they painted them, and it's kind of a light version of that, kind of a very light desert pink. Anyway, I just thought that would look uh, look fairly cool, and so with everything, I primed it with Badger Steinle Res Primer. I put my paint colors over it, and then I hit it with a coat of uh, Future or Pledge Floor Polish to just give it a gloss coat and also to give some strength to the paint. And the next thing I'm going to do is assemble the model and move on to the next steps. I forgot to mention the inner frame parts and the gun. Uh, the inner frame parts were primed in Badger Steinle Res Primer. I haven't put any paint over it. I'm going to go over this with a dry brush of, right now I'm thinking a dry brush of German Gray and then Sky Gray to bring out the, the edge highlights. Um, I may change my mind here in the next few minutes as I go to do that. And then this was, the gun was painted in uh, German gray, or I think it's called, uh, I can't remember now, and I don't have the paint bottle in front of me, XF63, I believe is the color from Tamiya. Um, it's kind of a German gray green. And then I added in just a little bit of neutral gray to gray it up a bit more and uh, use that as the basis for this, and then coated this in future also. And I'll go in and paint some extra details and do the panel lining, of course, but I kind of like the look of that gun. Kind of cool. All right, I thought I was going to do it in German gray, but I did some tests off screen, and I decided that this basalt gray uh, from Vallejo would work a little better. It's, it's lighter than German gray, but a little darker than neutral gray, so it's somewhere in the middle of that. Main thing I'm looking for when I'm doing dry brushing, though, is just contrast. Not the Citadel paint, but <laughs> contrast between two colors. Because you, you want the... Whether you're doing a, a wet brush technique, a heavy dry brush, a light dry brush, or all of those in stages, you want each successive layer of dry brushing to show some bit of contrast between the base color and what you're adding to it. And because of the way they go on, they tend to be fairly transparent, unless you do it really heavy. So you have to account for that, that if you, you know, for instance, if I painted German gray over this and showed you here's a spot of German gray and here's a, a spot of black, you would definitely see the difference. But when I tested doing it dry brushing, you really couldn't see the difference. So with this basalt gray, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do a much heavier dry brushing that I'm not going to be just concentrating on the edges. I'm going to want to get, um, I'm going to do some stippling and things like that around the frame to get a little bit of a, a worn, steely look, and uh, and just just hopefully make it look cool. See how it is there? Is that in focus? That's what I'm going for. Something like that. Uh, maybe just a little bit more. Let me add some of that in. I've started doing more experiments with this stippling with the big fluffy brush. Um, I've seen seen it on several places, but where, where it's really caught my eye is watching a channel card called Artis, Artis Opus. Artis, not artist, no T on the end, Artis Opus. Uh, it's a YouTube channel. It's about painting Warhammer minis. But the, uh, the fellow that does those videos, and I, I apologize, I can't remember his name, but he does those videos and shows... Uh, a lot of different dry brushing and stippling techniques. And he, uh, hang on one second, let me focus on this so the camera won't keep jumping in and out of focus. 
but he does some really fantastic work, some uh, very refined looking finishes using just dry brushing um, and stippling. And I've always been a fan of, of dry brushing. I know uh, a lot of people tend to downplay it and say it's, you know, not a, a real technique, but I, I think it works. Um, and it gets some effects that, you know, I don't think there's any other way to do it, you know, like this particular effect. There may be other ways to do it, but this is so quick and efficient. Why not use it? But anyway, I've been watching that channel, and I've found it really helpful. Um, and I plan that you're going to be seeing uh, probably, uh, unless I change my mind, which I'm apt to do from time to time, but you're going to be seeing a lot more of me experimenting with that dry brush and stippling technique to see what kind of finishes I can achieve through that because one of the things I always try to do and I, I, I try to do it and I urge other people to do it is constantly try out new techniques new ways of doing things uh, look for people and channels and content that will you know push you in that direction because that's how you build your your, your toolbox of skills and that's how you get experience and you, you figure what works and what doesn't and what you like and what you don't like and, and also you know you, you may find some things that you want to use in the future some other things you may not want to but it's a real helpful process in my opinion so anyway check out that channel after this video of course and uh, and see what you think of it but I'm going to continue doing this this technique around the, the armor parts and uh, then I'll move on into proper construction I want to do some detailing on the gun. Um, I've already painted in the barrel. This is a mix of ultramarine contrast paint from Citadel and Lead Belcher just to give it kind of a blue steely look. And uh, But I want to do just a little bit of detailing so that it's not such a flat color all over. So what I want to do is I'm going to use this Vallejo Camo Olive Green as my base color. It's very close to to the color it already it's already painted and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add some white and some black to it and make a lighter variant and a darker variant and then just paint some details around on the gun itself and on the scope here when I'm mixing paints like this I find that I like to if I'm if I'm going to make a lighter shade I like to take the base and put it into white rather than trying to put the white into the base because it only takes a little bit of the base to start making the the white get to the color you want but if you start trying to add a bunch of white to the base color you can use a whole lot of paint to get what you're looking for so I'm just gonna work that in until I get a lighter shade of the green that's about what I'm looking for right there. And you see that only took it was a pretty big blob of white. It only took a little bit of a little bit of the green to get it down where I wanted. So now I'm just adding water to thin that down a little bit so that I can paint it on. And then when you're wanting to make a darker color while I clean my brush, when you're wanting to make a darker color of the base, my preference is to go the opposite way, to take the black and then mix it into the base because black will take this over very quickly. So if you try to add a bunch of the base to black, you're going to be adding a whole lot of base to, uh, to get it where you want it. But by adding the black into the base, you get there much easier. And again, I'll just thin this down so that it's ready for painting. And now I've got those three colors like I want, and I can start putting them on the gun. All right, I'll start laying this lighter color down here on this back part. And it's going to take a couple of coats because you see I'm putting it on very thin, so it's not covering real well, but that's by design because I want to get a nice smooth coat on there. So as uh, Duncan Rhodes says, multiple thin coats. We'll give you a nice finish and so I'm gonna follow his advice all right I've got variations on a theme there I have the the base paint that I put in here the darker version right there 
the lighter version here and I put some of the darker on the scope. Now I want to go in and paint just a few more details, a few more things, uh, and I'm going to use this basalt gray which I used on the inner frame when I did the dry brushing. So hopefully it'll kind of tie everything together. All right, there it is. I'm pretty happy with that. Got some color variation. Either later on in this video or in the next one I'll add some shades and other chipping and some other things like that. I'm not sure where I'll end up in this video, but um, that's the base colors and I like the way that looks. Now there are some pipe details along the the top of the torso there, on the front of the head, and on the top of the shoulders. And I think I want to paint those with Citadel's Balthazar Gold, which is a, a basically a kind of a brownie bronze color. I thought it would work well to just have a few elements of shiny metallic on the mobile suit. And I thought these pipes would be a good place to put it, so I'm just going to apply that. And I just thinned it down with just a little water. This is a really nice paint, covers well, and uh, just really sells the notion of a shiny metallic thing. So I thought it would be a nice, nice touch. All right, that's on there, and it's looking mighty shiny. So I think it's kind of cool. I was starting assembly, and I put that shoulder pauldron there on the right arm, and I still say that looks like Darth Maul sticking his tongue out. <laughs> well, there he is all snapped up. You can see how the colors work together. I, I kind of like that. Um, looking at it now, you know, and I suppose I could go and change it, but I'm not. But looking at it now, I wish that I would have made this maybe just a little lighter a little more red so there'd be a little more contrast between you can see it here on the knees between the whole red and the very dark whole red there's not a lot of difference there um, but otherwise I kinda like the the way uh, these work together the the splashes of yellow on there the Balthazar gold that kinda stands out there so uh, I'm, I'm happy with the color choices I, I, I never <laughs> Whenever I kind of go off on my own on the colors, to be honest, when I get to the end of it, I never really think, yeah, that's 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 uh, that's good stuff there. I'm I I wrestle with color choices, and uh, I'm never quite satisfied with them. But I, I know what my level of <laughs> what my level of yeah that'll do pig kind of stuff is, and you know this is a yeah that'll do pig. Uh, kind of color, so I'm good with it. Now to show you, this this is a a big mobile suit, a big model. If you're not familiar with with Gunpla, this is one one forty fourth scale, and your typical Gunpla of this scale is this big. So you can see how this one is just massive compared to uh, this little GM kit, and and uh, so this is a really big one. That's one of the reasons I like it. Uh, is because even though it's this scale, its actual size is much bigger, closer to, it's getting closer to a master grade level than than uh, the high grade level in terms of size. So it's going to make this get a little more surface area and make this fun to weather. So I'm looking forward to that part of it. All right, well, I think I'm going to call uh, this video about finished. I've done everything I wanted to accomplish in this one. I thought about putting on some decals, but I, I actually like the, when I'm going to weather a Gunpla, uh, I actually like not putting on decals so that the weathering can kind of take center stage. Um, if, I put, if I do them clean, I tend to like putting decals on because that gives some additional visual interest. Now, I may change my mind between now and when I start doing the second part of this video so if in the second part of this video if you're, you're watching it and I say well I decided to put on decals don't don't be surprised because you know I, I never know what I'm gonna do sometimes I'll think it I'll think I want to do one thing and then I'll change my mind but for right now I'm not planning on putting uh, any decals on there and I think I've got all the the stuff painted I want to paint so 
I will just say uh, thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it uh, helpful in terms of if, if you're planning on building this or if you're just looking at getting into Gumpler or something like that. I would recommend this kit to anybody. It's If you've never built Gunpla, this will be a great one to start with because there's there's really no, there's nothing to trip you up in this one. It's just a, a big, big honking uh, model, Gunpla model kit that looks really cool. If you have built Gunpla, you're probably going to want to build this one because the build experience is very good. And... Uh, if you do like I, I will say if you do like I do, which is to clip the pegs so that you can later disassemble it, you're, you're very definitely going to want to be careful of which, which things you clip because since there's no poly caps in use here, um, don't clip something that is, is going to require something else to be slotted into it in terms of movement and articulation. So that's the only caution I would give is just be careful of that if you're a, 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 a clipper like I am. And you'll probably need to use a few bits of glue to keep things together. But this this is a fabulous kit. Very few seam lines. The ones that are there are easy to deal with. And it's just a wonderful build experience. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. And uh, especially if you're hanging around here at the end. I'm always grateful for the folks that, that uh, hang around and, and watch the whole thing. So thank you very much. Uh, if you've not already done so, there's a subscribe link somewhere down over here, so please take a look at that. Uh, click that if you would and hit the little bell icon. I would be most grateful. There are links to social media down below, of course. If you're on one of those platforms, please connect with me there. I'd love to hear from you. There's also a link to Patreon. If you're interested in finding out what that's about, uh, please click on that and take a look. If you are a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for your support of the work I do. It, it really, truly makes all of this possible. We just couldn't afford for me to do the things that I do at the pace that I do with the materials and the kits that I, that I do it um, if it weren't for you. So thank you so much for your support in my efforts to uh, bring this content onto the YouTubes. And with all that said, I'll leave you with one final thought, as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.